Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome dear participants to this module. In the previous module we had discussed the relationship between feminist theories and men's and masculinity scholarship. In today's module we shall look at a much neglected area in this field, the post-colonial masculinity and the narratives of otherness explicated in the intra-study of masculinities. We will review the relationship between post-colonial masculinities and westernized white masculinities. Today our discussion is based on an article by Fatane Farahani and Suruchi Thapar Jorkit. The title of their article is Post-Colonial Masculinities, Diverse, Shifting and Influx. Fatane Farahani teaches at Stockholm University, Sweden. Her research interests and teaching experiences are shaped by gender and sexualities, post-colonial theories, diaspora and transnationalism, critical race and whiteness studies, hospitality and hostility. Suruchi Thapar Jorkit teaches at Upasla University, Sweden. She researches in the areas of gender, colonialism and nationalism, gendered violence, ethnicity, etc. Multidisciplinary nature of research in the area of gender is also apparent in their work. This essay, Postcolonial Masculinities, Diverse Shifting and Influx, had appeared in the Rootley International Handbook of Masculinity Studies, published in 2019. Farahani and Thapar initiate their discussion by referring to two seminal texts of constructed otherness. Namely, Simone de Boas, The Second Sex, a text which we have discussed in detail, and Friends Fanon's Black Skin and White Mask. According to the authors, the idea of the post colonial man and post colonial masculinity is embedded in the narratives of otherness and racial blindness. In order to understand the racial blindness in the masculine discourse, it is essential to understand the racial blindness in the feminist discourse. Bua emphasizes the othering process of white women while Fanon focuses on the construction of the masculine racial other. These two critics exclude several categories. Bua's conceptualization of women mainly includes white heterosexual middle class women. Her instrumental operationalization of the slave woman analogy and her portrayal of women as slaves of men does not acknowledge female racial oppression. Similarly, Fanon's exclusive focus on race not only disregards other power relations but also fails to consider the particularities of the processual power relations across the continuum of skin color. Sexuality class and the ways in which these relations shape the lived experiences of men and women. The authors draw on a post-colonial critical masculinities framework. The authors explicate the complexities of post-colonial masculinities and the notions of otherness associated with the process of othering white women in the second sex and marginalization of masculine racial other in black skin and white masks. According to Farhani and Jorkit, the two aforementioned categories are narrow constructs in considering our current situatedness. As we acknowledge an attempt to rectify gender and racial blindness, we evaluate and accommodate all an ever evolving dynamic categorization. The authors aim to expose the us versus them dichotomy prevalent in the discourses on white masculinity 
versus post-colonial masculinity. The discourse on gender othering is similar to the discourse on racial othering because both are based on the archetypes of dominance and subjugation. In tracing the historical genealogy of Fanon and Bua, this discussion evaluates the following prisms. First, racial blindness of Western feminist theories and their complicity in establishing essentializing cultural scripts on masculinity. Secondly, the gender blindness and heteronormativity of male post-colonial theories despite their influential interventions on processes of otherization. Thirdly, ethnocentrism and race blindness of primarily Western and white masculinity studies with a few exceptions. Also, the authors draw on a post-colonial critical masculinities framework to evaluate migrate and diasporic masculinities. Like the feminine subject, the masculine subject is constructed through the lens of the oriental versus occidental manhood. The bodies are categorized on the basis of color, ethnicity, facial features, culture, clothing, language, geography, gender and sexual orientation. Many post-colonial feminist theorists and critics such as Patricia Hill Collins, Bell Hooks, Mohanty and Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak have emphasized that colonial discourses like sexist discourses are maintained by the fixity of the construct of the other. N. Laura Stoller in 1919 publication has vigilantly shown how colonial authority and racial distinctions were and still are fundamentally arranged in gender terms. Therefore, women were degraded not only as oriental and colonial subjects but also in gender specific ways. According to the authors, the process of othering begins from the feminine subject and therefore, the feminist theories are important for the men's and masculinity discourse to understand the valorization of the white skin and the exoticization of the other. Feminist thinkers observe that colonial and orientalist discourses have historically employed sexuality as a prominent signifier for representing otherness, such as the fascination with beauty behind the veil and the eroticization of the harem in orientalist texts. Women were placed under two categories. First, the chaste, desexualized Christian pious women, and secondly, the sexual primitive available exotic women. The latter description was associated mainly with African women, however, the fear of racial mixing was also always present. By valorizing white skin, the socio cultural hierarchy was rigidified in the society. These relations were further complicated when viewed through the lens of gender. Oriental promiscuous femininity in the mysterious harem was constructed in opposition to the non-sexual, passionless, domesticated femininity of the European middle class nuclear family. This oppositional gendering foregrounded the binary polarization of the chaste, desexualized Christian woman in the marital home, with the promiscuous, morally suspect non-Christian woman always available in a sexualized harem. The racialized desire towards the exoticized oriental woman and the primitivized and eroticized African women were compounded with fear of racial mixture and interracial exchange. Interracial exchange was considered to be a threat to the purity of nation and it led to a harnessed racial mixing by colonialists. As a tool to drive a wedge between blacks and mixed race groups and between all people of color and the whites. Through valorization of lighter skinned mixed race groups, pigmentocracies or shadyism, colonialists established a hierarchy that linked skin color to social and economic class. In fact, groups that gained political and economic power as a result of what is known as the mitisaj, that is the cultural mix of society, 
maintained their dominant position by discrimination against others who are further down the skin color scale. This discourse continues after colonialism and remains relevant in contemporary times. Interracial relationships become further complicated when viewed through the prism of gender. While sexual relationships between white men and racialized women have historically been silently accepted, racialized particularly black men's relationships with white women has meant putting their lives at risk. For example, the black peril panics in South Africa, Papua New Guinea and Rhodesia. Thus, the patriarchal nature of white supremacy not only ratifies the dominance of white men over racialized men, but also contributes to the partial decrease of white women's racial privileges if and when they enter or inhabit an interracial intimate relationship. It would be pertinent to refer to Leela Ahmed here who has defined colonial feminism as the western men's exploitation of oriental women in the name of saving brown women from brown men. Hierarchization as explicated by Farhani and Thapar Jorkin. Cultural scripts on race associated the constructs of masculinity of other men as either feeble and desexualized as in the case of the Asian, heroic and revolutionary as in the case of the Kurdish, hypersexualized as in the case of the black and femininity as undisciplined and promiscuous in the case of the black in exotic and erratic in the case of the Arab and Muslim. This genealogy never entered the Western feminism. Post-colonial feminists acknowledged the race blindness of Western feminist theories and gender blindness of male post-colonial theories. However, they failed to analyze racialized men as gendered subjects. The authors point out that while post-colonial feminist pedagogy highlighted the racialization of the female body, it did not recognize the violence on the masculine and the gendered bodies. According to the authors, the westernized models of masculinity studies have analyzed Euro-American masculinities in considering such hierarchization. The definition of a man is limited to the white British or American male. If we look at the race blindness of Western masculinities studies, we find that the subject of men and masculinity formation has been a consistent topic in Western academia for the last three decades and has challenged the discourses on men, about men and ungendered men. Connell and Messerschmitt have previously argued that masculinities studies remain largely divorced from discussions of femininities and since gender is always relational, patterns of masculinity are socially defined in contradictions from some model of femininity. Farhani and Thapar Jorkate present some contentious concerns in this context. They say that the studies of western masculinity or western masculinities have mainly examined Euro-American masculinities, though some are caused within localized ethnographic accounts. They also say that these studies have been notably criticized for falling short due to their ethnocentrism, race blindness, lack of historical specificity, false causality, to some extent psychologization and conceptual ambiguity. The authors say that the post-colonial historiography re-enacts the dialogical relations between the North and the rest, the North with all its heterogeneities and the rest with all its entities and complexities. So, the post-colonial historiography re-enacts the dialogical relations between the North and the rest, a relationship that was essential to the formation of the ethos of modernity as well as construction of modern and non-modern, progressive and primitive, female or male gendered subject positions. This discrimination and racial blindness has exposed the Eurocentric ideals 
of defining masculinity as subjects beyond colonization and subjugation. We need to pay attention to the geospatial subject positions and post-colonial experiences at the margins. In order to provide alternative readings of gendered agency and subjectivity and also at the same time respond to the issues of non-representation and power. Since the post-colonial incorporates both after colonization and beyond colonization, it is imperative to examine how diverse and interesting post-colonial masculine subject positions after and beyond colonialism are formed in relation with in response to in discontinuation with different types of masculine position during colonialism and vice versa through colonialism. The authors point out that different geospatial locales produce multiple diverse and vibrant identities. Such diversification can take into account multiple factors such as race, class, ethnicity, language, nationality, etc. and construct a global narrative. However, diversification can also lead to human slotting on the basis of what makes them them and what makes us us as distinct signifiers and significations. In the context of multiculturalism, masculinity in the experiences of men in their transnational local diasporic geolocals influence and shape the sensibilities and simultaneously constitute new identities. This exhibits the plurality in the construction of masculinities as well as femininities. Interestingly, a gendered, raised, classed and aged generational understanding of diaspora and transnational practices is also essential for understanding the hierarchies and intersecting forms of power that are simultaneously enacted and negotiated between as well as within different communities. Metropolitan countries process not only men and women differently, but also different men differently and slot them into predetermined hierarchical racialized boxes, Middle Eastern, East Asian, East European, African or Asian etc. A range of factors such as race, ethnicity, skin color, education, age, language, dialect, religion or social capital etc. can become agents of discrimination and identity formation. Interestingly, many people encounter the West long before coming to the West and conversely Western people have also constructed their Westernness by constructing an Orientalist Orient. Similarly, many cultures construct masculinity while rejecting alternate masculinities. The marginalization of alternate modes of masculinities rigidifies hegemonic masculinity. According to Farhani, linear ways of studying men and masculinities, geographical locals and cultures produce a reductionist approach to culture, people and especially gender and sexuality. Unidimensional ways of studying men and masculinities produce an essential approach to gender and sexuality and narratives of other than western maleness. Farhani and Thapar Jorkit emphasize on the construction of masculinities of young and second generation immigrant men through problematic discourses. Such discourses tie race and ethnicity to crime, problematic and aggressive sexuality and also radicalization. They generate a moral panic concerning homegrown criminals. They also single them out as inferior in relation to their white counterparts and vilify and demonize them. Masculinities play a crucial role in the construction of the self-image of men across the globe irrespective of culture, race, ethnicity, gender and sexuality. Diverse migratory experiences of social, political and economic marginalization of many displaced men 
reduce them to the category of the subordinate other. The local and global constructions of masculinities are related and shaped by discontinuities of intersecting hierarchical racial social class based and rural urban division. According to Farhani's studies, Iranian homosexuals, Iranian Kurds, Iranian Baloch, Iranian Azadis, Iranian Americans and Iranian Baha experience discrimination due to their ethnicity, sexuality and beliefs as they lived in their own country. Farhani also says that similar to white middle class heterosexual men in the West, ethnically Persian heterosexual Muslim subjects who belong to the normative and most powerful ethnic group in Iran have the luxury of overlooking the centrality of gender, sexuality and class in shaping their lives in Iran. However, they face different racializing practices in diaspora that mark them as non-white and also therefore non-normative. While many ethnic groups may have the privilege of overlooking discriminatory behavior, non-white men have to overcome multiple racist practices and prove themselves to be more than just a post-colonial subject. Farhani also notes in her study that many first generation migrant men face devaluation on the basis of their education skills, previous work experiences etc. However, they did not recognize this as a sign of discrimination. In studying diasporic masculinities and the discrimination faced by racial masculine subject, Farhani notes that patterns of negation and deformed hegemonic progression are prevalent in all men and gendered bodies. The difference is that some men may recognize such patterns while some cannot or even refuse to recognize them. Men experience different conflicts and problems due to their backgrounds, names, looks, accents, etc., which become the basis of discrimination. Thus, we see an imprint of convenience and indifference with respect to discrimination passed from one generation to other. Farhani observes that discrimination is prevalent within all men as a construct. According to the authors, being white and being part of the dominant white discourse cannot resolve the conflicts faced by men and especially the post-colonial men. The narratives of men with different ethnic backgrounds also demonstrate how understandings of race are also forced to be reworked in diaspora. Rejecting racism and being subjected to racism in a post-colonial scenario amplify the crisis in masculinities. Being white or becoming white does not resolve the conflicts within the discourse of masculinities. This also indicates not only the simultaneous existence of different masculinities, but also simultaneous presence of different masculinities in each and every man. Therefore, even the most sovereign masculinity has to be earned or achieved. Ruling masculinities are themselves conditional, relational, subject to anxiety and destabilization. However, limiting oneself to the localized ethnic group and community will not produce favorable results. Masculinity studies attempt to break such formulations and rigid foundations on the basis of race, ethnicity, locale, language, culture, gender and gender performance etc. Nevertheless, it is imperative to examine these masculinities as negotiated in and through a specific historical and special context and in relation to other masculinities. Farhani and Thapar Jorket opine that the meanings of masculinity are affected and shaped by cultural borrowing. Masculinities imported from elsewhere are conflated with local ideas to produce new configurations. Louis Archer comments that more localized discourses of the gangster masculinities, that is membership of the gangs, employ an association between popular black identities and hegemonic ideals of masculinities 
which stand in sharp contrast to prior stereotypes. For example, the popular black identities and hegemonic ideals of masculinity such as status, coolness or strength were contrasted with the prior existing stereotypes of Asian masculinity as being soft or weak or effeminate. We can also look at other examples such as Farhani's work on Iranian men, Jokit's work on second generation British Pakistani Muslim men in Bradford, UK, Brinalini Sinha's work on colonial masculinity in 19th century India or Amal Kabesh's work on masculinities in England and Egypt. These examples establish the multiple voices present in post-colonial masculinities. It reflects the global narrative on maleness and at the same time encourages the relevance of post-colonial men's and masculinities studies. Ethnographic studies are important as they illustrate the heterogeneous nature of masculinities as a social construct and as a discourse in itself. They allow the readers to investigate particular subject positions in specific contexts together with their intersections with different power relations. Furthermore, it also showcases a simultaneous coexistence and embodiment of different notions of masculinities by men which are valorized in different colonial or post-colonial contexts. Today we have initiated a novel discussion on post-colonial men and masculinities as opposed to the westernized models of maleness and masculinities. Farhani and Thapar Jorkit acknowledge the diversity present within the discourse of post-colonial masculinity. To conclude, we may say that the authors reflect on seminal developments in the constitution of post-colonial masculinities as a critical dimension of post-colonial historiography which arguably are re-articulated, contested and negotiated in and through specific historical moments, spatial context, local and transnational discourses and in relation to other dominant or hegemonic white masculinities. Therefore, these assertions are not fixed and coherent, but fractured by other forms of identification such as class, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, age and place. Understanding racialized or marginalized masculinities through post-colonial perspectives necessitates a recognition of the diversity of socio-political specificities as well as interrelationships that can display how men are disprivileged based on intersecting factors. While taking on diasporic masculinities, the authors aim to address a lacuna in much of mainstream masculinity studies and also feminist post-colonial studies which have mainly focused on women. The authors conclude by suggesting that the subjective category men is in a state of transition and the post-colonial men as a conceptual category is in a state of flux. Therefore, it is crucial to negotiate this position of disprivileged men other than the white British or American men in the colonial context and narrative. Dislocatory experiences for men in terms of their marginality and alienation from dominant white discursive constructions shape their everyday lives in different ways. We can assess these through the macro geospatial lens of a country or through local discourses on building masculinity within a classroom to closeted vanity at a performance space. Homeland, home, workplace and school continue to exert an influence on social identities in new destinations or place of habitation as men and also as women. Such dislocatory experiences in post-colonial diasporic spaces and contexts transform and translate the ways in which masculinities are negotiated, disrupted or operate in a state of flux. We will continue our discussion on masculinity 
in the next module also. In the next module, we will study the role of men in gender mobilization and gender equality in the 21st century to further the course of men's and masculinity studies on a global scale. Thank you.